Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, we have two feature stories for you. Mississippians are familiar with catfish farming. Today, we'll introduce you to aquaponics, a variation of hydroponics. It's a symbiotic system involving growing vegetables and fish. In Southern Gardening, fall mums. They come in many colors, and we'll have some care tips you must follow to keep them looking good. Our first feature story today is a new one. You'll meet the new Mississippi Forestry Association Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year. Multiple use and multiple income sources are staples on Patrice O'Brien's Twin Oaks Farm in Yalabusha County. Enjoying wildlife is another. One day I was riding my four-wheeler down through here, and as I got down to this end, a mother turkey flew up into the tree and there were all kinds of little baby turkeys just right there around me. It was so exciting, so thrilling to watch them as they took to cover and, and I was just right there amongst them. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Our first story today takes us to Yalabusha County in North Mississippi. Leighton, Thursday night, Patricia O'Brien was honored as the Mississippi Forestry Association's new Outstanding Tree Farmer of the Year. While couples have received the award in the past, she is the first woman to receive it outright. O'Brien and her sister, Joy Swearingen, own Twin Oaks Farm. There's a long family history at Twin Oaks, but tradition doesn't mean living in the past. O'Brien and her family make Twin Oaks pull its weight by developing multiple income streams on the property. One day I was riding my four-wheeler down through here, and as I got down to this end, a mother turkey flew up into the tree, and there were all kinds of little baby turkeys just right there around me. It was so exciting, so thrilling to watch them as they took to cover, and, and I was just right there amongst them. Wildlife management for hunting and enjoyment is one of the many goals being accomplished at Twin Oaks Farm. The 1,200-acre tree farm is located in Yalabusha County. It's owned by O'Brien and her sister, Joy Swearingen. O'Brien is the managing partner. She's definitely not an absentee landlord. What got my attention was her enthusiasm in managing just not necessarily the, the forest, but the entire property, it being a good steward of the entire property, different all aspects uh, of a property she's real involved. Twin Oaks has been a certified tree farm since 1959. The farm has been under a written management plan since O'Brien's father passed away in 1982. It's been a real uh, pleasure working with them. That They've got just a, a variety of, of stands and I was able to update their tree farm plan two years ago with 1,200 acres. They've got, uh, I think I calculated, there were about 20 different stands on the property and a, and a variety of age class distributions. So we got a, a lot to work with. As far as wildlife, we have the hunt club revenues and then we have the fish club revenues. And my husband is exploring and getting into beekeeping and uh, I do some production gardening. Multiple income streams are a priority at Twin Oaks. The goal is to use the land's resources in a sustainable, professionally managed manner. When we first came up here and talked to Patrice and them, one of the first things she said was, she wants something growing on, on every inch of her farm. And, uh, and she didn't care if that was grass, trees, or whatever. If she couldn't grow trees there, she was gonna grow something else there. One of those income streams is hunting leases. Gary Crafton leads the Tillatoba Hunting Club on the Twin Oaks property. O'Brien wanted a long-term lease with a small club. This fit Crafton and his brother Glenn's expectations. This allows them to make facility investments they would not otherwise make if the lease was year to year. They also practice quality deer management. This is the largest buck harvested so far 
but all bucks have increased in size. Deer of this size were the high-end bucks that we were seeing on this place when we first began hunting on this lease. And uh, through uh, proper nutrition and age, we're now seeing more and more bucks like this, letting the young, young bucks live, harvesting numbers of does. With 48 acres of water and two lakes, fishing has always been an interest at Twin Oaks, especially for Lamar O'Brien, Patrice's husband. Professionally managed with the help of consultant Larry Clay, the lakes are now part of a fishing club where the members pay an annual fee. Archmouth bass, crappie, and brim can be found. At this point, catching a string of two to two and a half pound bass is common, with some 10 pounders reported. We've had this going on for about five years now, and uh, we've had consistent members every year. Matter of fact, this last year, we all of our members re-upped. I've been encouraged by it. Uh, this one in particular with the shad take, uh, like I said, we put them in about three years ago. Uh, everywhere we look today, we saw shad. So a bass or a crappie that's hungry, all they've got to do is open their mouth pretty much and, and get a meal. They're looking, like Larry said, for a quality fishing experience where on a private lake, they don't have a lot of the conflict with other folks in, in public lakes. They enjoy coming out here fishing. If they catch 10 or 15 fish, it's been a good day. Twin Oaks has been in Patrice O'Brien's family since the early 1840s. The oldest part of the farmhouse dates back to 1917, the barn to the 1940s. Trees blown down by storms are sawn into boards and used for repairs to the house and barn, such as this hallway flooring and kitchen cabinets. While Twin Oaks is a working farm, there are places known as special sites. This Cypress Lowland O'Brien and her daughter Kelly are walking through has been set aside for generations. This area has been set aside. Uh, my grandfather found, found it to be a special place um, and passed it down to his children. And my mom will pass it down to me. It, it really is just a special place. This is a sign, Bill. This, mm -hmm. is, this is the site of one of the darkest days at Twin Oaks Farm. It occurred in early spring 2007. A woods arsonist set fire to a nine-year-old 65-acre stand of Conservation Reserve Program hardwood trees. I could not believe that somebody would dislike us so much or have such an evil desire in their heart to burn these beautiful trees. I just could not believe it. While the whole stand did not burn, there was extensive damage. Fortunately, the fire occurred when the trees were dormant. In the spring, many of the trees grew sprouts from the roots called scions. That was a blessing, but for three winters, the O'Briens sawed out the dead trunks and thinned the scions all the while fighting briars and brush. If we hadn't done it, you would have had virtually non-merchantable trees here, or you would have had some, uh, because each one of these scions takes uh, energy from the roots there. So they're competing with each other. Really what you want is to be able to eliminate down to the main scion, so all the energy from the roots go into this main scion. The CRP hardwood trees have been planted originally in an effort to halt the growing erosion along Tillatoba Creek and its tributary on Twin Oaks Farm. The problem started in the 1960s after the construction of Interstate 55 west of the farm. Inadequate culverts prompted flooding along the creek. Dredging efforts downstream of Twin Oaks eventually caused massive amounts of erosion on Twin Oaks itself. O'Brien remembers when the tributary creek was a ditch you could step over. We've estimated that we've lost probably somewhere between four and a half and, and eight acres of land. Valuable, cultivatable, fertile cropland to this creek erosion. O'Brien and her sister, with support from Yalabusha County, worked with Mississippi's U.S. Senators Thad Cochran and Trent Lott. Money was finally allocated in the 2002 Farm Bill to install berms, drainage pipes, and riprap. We'd already spent over $10,000 in, in pipes and culverts and ditch work to hold what we thought we could hold, but it kept washing out. Even the county roads up here, they've spent probably close to a million dollars on bridges. While Patrice O'Brien is a hands-on tree farm owner, she's also very active on behalf of forestry in Mississippi and the United States. She's hosted forestry field days at Twin Oaks, 
O'Brien has served in several positions with the Mississippi Forestry Association, including the Board of Directors. Nationally, she's been a member of the Forest Landowners Association, serving as a regional vice president and board member, even traveling to Washington to lobby on behalf of forestry. She's also been the president of the Rankin County Forestry Association, and she was the secretary treasurer for many, many years. A lot of things get done when Patrice O'Brien's involved. Eventually, the care of Twin Oaks Farm will fall to the fifth generation, O'Brien's children, Kelly and Brad. Twin Oaks appears to be in good hands. But there's something about having a place to call home and having a piece of property that's your own, not just a house, but land to tend and a garden to grow and fresh tomatoes on the table. And um, it's hard to imagine life without Twin Oaks, um, finding your, your peaceful spot. You can watch this story again on Patrice O'Brien on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. The website address is farmweek.msucares.com. If you're interested in managing your land for timber and wildlife, you can get in touch with the Mississippi State University Extension Service or the Mississippi Forestry Commission. The Natural Resources Conservation Service or the U.S. Department of Agriculture is another good place to start. Get in touch with the Mississippi Forestry Association as well. The MFA can get you in touch then also with your county forestry association. We'll have all this contact information on our Farm Week website and Facebook fan page. And Leighton, it was, a, it was a joy to go visit the place. Now, you know, this is not an overnight success. She's been working, they've been working on this since 1982. Oh, you can tell it's a... So keep that in mind when you're thinking, oh, I could never do that. Get a written plan and start. And there is lots of good information out there from government agencies. Although I gotta admit right now, the NRCS is closed down. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, congratulations to Patrice and her family. Thanks, Artis, good story. Well, it's time now for our trivia quiz on Farm Week. This one about sheep, the wool they produce, and where they live. Here's the question. What country in the world produces the most wool? Is the answer China, Australia, New Zealand, or the United States? We'll have the answer after today's Southern Gardening segment. Have you ever wondered about how to add more landscape color during the fall season? In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will show us how fall flowering mums can enhance the autumn landscape. Just as the changing colors in nature signal the arrival of autumn, so does the appearance of beautiful flowering mums. Today I'm at Pine Hills Nursery enjoying their colorful fall mums. Adding fall mums, which is actually short for chrysanthemum, is a stress-free way to add color to the fall landscape. It's easy to see why, as there will be more flowers than you could possibly count. The selection of colors can almost seem limitless, from rustic earth tones to bright and cheery pastels. There are also a wide variety of sizes available from four inch pots all the way up to one gallon and bigger. Choosing fall mums in full flower will have an instant impact for any autumn get together or event. I like to select plants that still have tight buds and are just starting to show color. This increases the period of showy display as the buds begin to open in the garden. Always place mums in a spot that receives full sun. This will ensure the absolute best flowering. And never let your fall mums wilt. This is the quickest way to end the flowering show as the plants will be slow to recover. One of my favorite ways of using fall mums is in containers in the landscape. I select a large plant and simply place the plant, container and all, into a beautiful decorative pot. That way there's no need to remove and replant from the original container. Adding fall mums to your landscape will create a color splash for you to enjoy during the cooler months of the year. I'm Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. Mums are native to Asia and Northeast Europe. They were first cultivated in China as early as 600 years ago. Time now for the answer to today's trivia quiz on Farm Week. Again, it's about what country in the world produces the most wool. The United States accounts for less than 1% of world wool production and we are a net importer of wool. According to the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, the answer is China. In 2010, China produced more than 
406,000 tons of wool. Australia was a close second. New Zealand was third. These three alone produced almost as much as the next seven countries combined. We're going to pause now for a break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll have the calendar and one more feature story for you. It combines aquaculture and hydroponics, and it's called aquaponics. See how fish farming and agriculture can come together. From our family to yours, Mississippi's farmers believe the best produce and livestock are grown right here at home. With ms.foodsearcher.com, you're only a click away. Using your smartphone, you'll be connected to hundreds of families and small businesses dedicated to providing you with fresh local foods. Produce, meats, fish, dairy, agritourism, community markets, and more are right at your fingertips no matter where you are. ms.foodsearcher.com. Before we get to our last story, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Two Forge Field Days were coming up in Mississippi. The Southeast Mississippi Forge Field Day will be Friday, October 25th. It takes place at Simmons Farm on McKenzie Road at Petal. The hours are 9 a.m. to noon. Admission is free, but registration is needed for lunch planning. The focus will be on stockpiling bahia grass and Bermuda grass to close the gap between summer and winter grazing. The Northwest Mississippi Forge Field Day will be the following Friday, November 1st. It will take place at Gordon Farms on Curtis Road at Batesville. The hours are 9 a.m. to noon. Admission is free, but please register if you would like to have lunch. The focus at this field day will be stockpiling tall fescue and how clovers can help mitigate fescue toxicity. Grazing demonstrations will also be covered. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. Our last feature story segment today combines aquaculture and hydroponics. It's called aquaponics. The Aztecs in Mexico may have been some of the first to try it. You'll meet a Midwestern entrepreneur who first looked at aquaponics as a hobby, but he's ramped up his operation since. Market to Market's Josh Bittner explains. You may not envision fish tanks on the prairie as the best place to look for added value amidst large agricultural operations. Nevertheless, some folks in America's heartland are giving it a try. Whether it's a hobby developed during the off season or an entrepreneurial foray into niche markets, sustainable, self-sufficient aquaponics systems are hatching in some unexpected locations. Though history suggests a rudimentary form of aquaponics existed in ancient civilizations, the modern blending of aquaculture and hydroponics has increased steadily since the late 1990s. Industry standards were developed at the University of the Virgin Islands, where the warm climate facilitated large-scale operations. Further north, though, the use of indoor aquaponics as a hedge against extreme summer heat doesn't seem that far-fetched to some. The symbiotic closed-loop method offers the opportunity to turn a small profit by growing crops typically cultivated in other regions of the country. Aquaponics is popular as a concept now and is going to be popular as an industry practice very soon. I would say in the next 20 years we're going to have a lot of our produce in the Midwest coming from aquaponics. Higher education has continued research into the science of this hybrid discipline. Promising scenarios have emerged for one-time curiosities to evolve into viable green operations. Aquaponics is a synergistic relationship between plants and fish. Basically, you feed the fish food. That protein then breaks down into uh, nitrate that can be used by the plants, and the plants strip the nitrate from the water, cleans up the water for the fish, and then the whole cycle continues. An emphasis on education and conservation are central to the mission of the Leopold Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Located on the campus of Iowa State University, the center seeks to reduce negative environmental impacts associated with farming 
and develop new revenue streams for producers. Leopold Center funding supports extension outreach efforts like those of fisheries and aquaculture specialist Alan Patillo. He and other instructors educate and advise students and the public on the science, economics, and marketing aspects of sustainable aquaculture. A lot of people wonder how do you grow plants in water uh, whenever you can overwater a plant and it starts to die. Well, the reason is we maintain a, a higher oxygen concentration in the water than you would be able to maintain in the soil. You get very fast growth rates out of the plants, uh, but you also get two products, fish and plants, and uh, the combination of those two can make you more profitable. All kinds of plants can be grown in this environment though herbs and leafy greens currently are the most common crop. And for those lured to try their luck raising fish, a certain African species just might be the perfect catch. OK, he's a good size. Right now, we're using the Nile tilapia, and that's a very popular species to use for aquaponics. Uh, it's very easy to grow. Uh, it has a lot of tolerance to poor water quality, which for a beginning fish farmer might uh, be an issue for them. Oh, who's the TV star today? Iowa State Extension helps local producers kickstart operations that seek value in the spaces between the traditional monoculture of corn and soybeans. Earl and Jeff Hafner operate Early Morning Harvest near Panora, Iowa. The father-son team says for generations in their family, farming is the only life they've ever known. Firmly rooted in their role as stewards of the land, the Hafners began to incorporate their vision of sustainability over a decade ago. The whole farm's organic. Small grains, the wheat, the rye, the buckwheat, corn, soybeans, and also the pasture and forage for the cattle because the cattle's organic. We have to protect the environment. You know, every farmer out here, you know, the soil's his life. You know, the plants and the animals are his life. Anything that destroys the environment would destroy his livelihood or his kids' future's livelihood. After discovering aquaponics, Hafner helped pass his free time while serving in the military overseas by reading up on the subject. Upon returning to Iowa, he expected to simply start a new hobby. What intrigued me the most is I, Grandma was a big gardener. I always liked the garden, uh, however you plant your garden. And as most people know, then you have to go plant your corn and soybeans. You come back 30, 40 days later, and you about know what your garden looks like. Noting the crucial value of water during his stint in the Middle East validated the importance of conservation to Hafner. And aquaponics presented an opportunity to keep precious resources from going to waste. What I like about it is technically the only way water leaves this greenhouse is evaporation and transpiration. And that's the sustainable part of it. As water, we're in a drought now. As the world population gets bigger, water is the huge issue. We've been blessed here in the Midwest. We might experience some of how tough it is down in Texas and some of those places. After receiving a grant from Iowa State to continue his work in aquaponics, Hafner took a hard look at the economics of the endeavor. If you wanted to raise cattle, you went to the banker and said, I'm going to raise 100 head of cattle. He knew there's industry standards. He knew the numbers. And when I was looking at the numbers, it was tough to find numbers on it. So that's where I said, I'll, I'll open my books up. And my first year was rough. Despite initial hurdles, early morning harvest pressed on, learning from its mistakes. Refining methods over time allowed the Hafners to share their newfound expertise with others. If you have a CSA and it's a two-thirds, three-fourths of a year type operation, you'd, you could add a small aquaponics greenhouse to help fill the gap, maybe keep your labor year-round that way. The free-flowing exchange of ideas has helped this growing field build momentum. For those dipping their toes into new markets that could be lucrative, Iowa State offers online resources as well. The Agricultural Marketing Resource Center and the National Market Maker site present information on business planning and connecting with buyers. If you're a small producer, you can find all those people within the community that are interested in getting your product, and they can see you. One of the nice things about aquaponics is that you can start very small and scale it up. Find your customer, find your client that's going to want your product, and as you've seen in this kind of system, you can create extremely high-value products. 
For Market to Market, I'm Josh Bittner. You can watch this story again on Aquaponics on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. The website is farmweek.msucares.com. We'll also have a link to the Market to Market website where you can see the story as well as read the entire script. Remember, YouTube and Facebook fans see Farm Week stories first on Fridays. Well, we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show, we'll have another Mississippi Forestry Association honoree. You'll be meeting the MFA's Outstanding Logger of the Year. He's Kent Winstead of Philadelphia. Winstead's crew is known for keeping the work site clean, streams unpolluted, and for his safety. In Southern Gardening, try these fall favorites. They're great for landscape beauty when the temperatures start to cool. And if you'd like further information on a Farm Week story or want to suggest one to us, Please write us. That's Farm Week Box 9625, Mississippi State, Mississippi 39762. Our email address, farmweek at ext.msstate.edu. Our telephone number is 662-325-2262. You can also contact us through your county extension service office. For the rest of the Farm Week crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.